Daniel gave you this topic, um, what has PEDV taught us about uh, biosecurity? And um, I thought about this a fair bit, and I thought the way to, to really address it was how we think about things. And uh, you might be familiar with this person called uh, Thomas Bayes, who was a theologian and a mathematician, and he has a theorem, Bayes' theorem, which is very well known in, in a lot of disciplines, and it's about probability, but how it really works is um, we have our beliefs, we have our knowledge, we have our opinion, and we think everything is right because that's the reason we hold those opinions, and then we discover some new information, and that new information makes us go back and question our knowledge and our information, and out the other end, we have uh, a revised probability or a revised opinion, so we're thinking differently because of the new experience, and there's a whole area of uh, statistics called Bayesian statistics that's based on his, uh, his theorem. So if we put that in the context of uh, biosecurity, so if I say what do we, what has PEDV taught us, that, that depends on what we already know. So what we knew or what we believed or what we thought about biosecurity, and then we have this new set of experiences as a country, and as individual producers, and then what we now know or think uh, about biosecurity and has it changed. And I'll, and I'll get to my answer at the end. I won't be talking about details, but really about uh, how people are perceiving uh, the problem. Um, if we go back to the beginning, what is biosecurity? It's protecting health by avoiding disease. And this is from the uh, FAO uh, uh, definitions. Uh, implementing measures that reduce risk of introduction, spread of disease agents. But what we know about biosecurity and making it happen, even at a national level, uh, at a farm level, is it requires a set of attitudes uh, and behaviours by people who recognise the right way to do things and reduce risk in everything they do. So it's not so much uh, a recipe as a, a culture and a set of attitudes and behaviours. So a couple of definitions in uh, swine production uh, with what we call external biosecurity, particularly here in the US, uh, and those of you familiar with the, the PADRAP uh, process, it's what we're doing to prevent the introduction of an agent, usually, or a disease to a farm, uh, or bio-exclusion or external biosecurity, uh, and there's also within the farm uh, things that we can done that are trying to prevent uh, transmission uh, within a farm. So uh, someone was referring the previous section to things like the uh, cross-fostering, stopping cross-fostering, those types of procedures that we, uh, when there's a high disease risk, we change our behaviours to try and stop transmission. Okay, the next thing about biosecurity is, is it a science or is it an art? Uh, the argument I'd make, there's more art than there is science in biosecurity. Uh, and there's reasons for that uh, because it is very hard to research. Most of the time when we're doing, uh, looking at, at preventing disease introduction, it's not a common event. So it's hard to research things that happen uncommonly uh, unless, of course, there's no biosecurity and we're moving sick pigs around. Once you take out the obvious risks, which are usually live animals and semen, uh, it gets more difficult to determine how disease can spread around. So when we're looking at how can a disease get into a farm, it's what might happen, all of the things that could go wrong, uh, and there's what does happen and how often. So very often when we're looking at potential for how could PEDV come into this country, uh, there's lots and lots of potential hypotheses people travelling, animals, illegal movement of animals, illegal movement of animal products, uh, potentially illegal movement of things like vaccine products. We don't know what goes on. Uh, so there's a whole lot of uh, uh, potential routes that it's very difficult often to design what does happen. So we know what could happen, but what ha does happen and how often. Uh, and the big problem with it a lot of the time is that... Uh, with things that occur at low probability, 
but happen very widely, uh, they can be a big problem. So I think the best uh, example, and we don't understand with PED virus about aerosol transmission. We had a debate for 10 years in the United States about whether PERS was transmitted by the aerosol route. Uh, there was very strong opinions that it didn't. Uh, then there were strong opinions that it, that it does. Uh, most people now accept that it can, but we don't really know how frequently it happens even now. Uh, the issue is that trying to reproduce it experimentally is very difficult. But the fact is we have thousands of thousands of farms exposed to lots and lots of other farms, and even though the risk of transmission is low, we have a lot of farms at risk. So these events can happen. So things like car accidents and foodborne disease. The U.S. food supply is very, very safe. The risk is very low. The number of deaths per year is quite high because everybody's eating three times a day. Well, not everybody, but many. So I use the analogy that researching biosecurity is a little like researching lightning strike. It happens, we know it happens, but we can't predict where and when. So it's, it's very difficult to do research of how a pathogen can get into a farm. And when we do have uh, disease introductions at a national level or at a farm level, it's very, very difficult to know with certainty where things come from, unless it's very obvious. If we have movement of clinically sick animals from farm A to farm B, there's not much mystery. It's very unlikely that the route wouldn't be that. If we eliminate those obvious routes, it's very, very difficult to know with certainty how a pathogen was introduced into a farm. So with biosecurity, being a science or art, there's a heavy amount of opinion and a relatively small amount of evidence about uh, our biosecurity practices. The example I like to use best on this is, is, some, is what we call downtime, the period of time we want people to be away from pigs before they come into a, a farm. And we have very long downtime on boar studs, and we have maybe less time uh, downtime on sow farms. We have less down, you know, less downtime on finishing farms, but the change is not really driven by our understanding of what the risk is, it's the understanding of the consequences. If we have an introduction at a boar stud or a sow farm, the costs are way, way higher. So it's really driven not by our understanding of the risk, it's driven by our understanding of the consequences. So we have a, certainly a number of publications on biosecurity, but most of the time, by necessity, they're in modelled contrived conditions, a lot of the times they're not very much replicated. So we're, we're working with a small amount of information. We have standards of biosecurity. So there's a very, the national, uh, uh, pork board, the ASV, uh, uh, Andrea Pitkin and Scott D did a very detailed uh, document on biosecurity practices for PERS transmission, which addresses most of the biosecurity principles. Uh, so we, we have guidelines for what good practices are, but the debate comes on how, how cost-effective are individual practices. Most of the time we're making a judgment, a compromise between, you know, uh, what would be reduce risk more but comes at a higher cost. So we're always trading a trade-off between the cost of biosecurity, the effectiveness of biosecurity, and there's the big issue of when we have the guidelines and we have best practices, do people follow them? So do people on the farm, do the uh, uh, people follow the rules that we lie down? So it's one thing, we have farm, we have standards, uh, we know there's compromise, uh, we know there's problems with compliance, uh, and they're all things we try and get our hands around. So this is just a schematic of uh, all the things we might think about, and there's probably others that we can't get here. So. Uh, biosecurity can come in on any of our farm inputs. So the obvious ones are animals and, and semen, uh, but theoretically we are dealing with biosecurity practices that could be related to air, water, feed, people, supplies, equipment, pests. Uh, the things going out uh, are of less concern, whether they're breeding stock going to other farms, they're, they're still relevant to the industry, but from the farm end it's really um, addressing all the risks associated with all these inputs to the farm 
uh, is what we're trying to get the, the best package of biosecurity measures. So I want to split here a little bit into thinking at the national level and thinking at the farm level uh, because the easiest way to prevent risk is to not allow movement. So my, my country of Australia has not allowed any live pigs into the country since about 1980. They've perhaps paid for it and from a point of view of genetics, but they have maintained uh, good uh, swine health risks. So a lot of important swine diseases aren't there, but they took the decision as a country to say, okay, we're just not letting pigs uh, come into the country because that is the primary route of disease there. So we have restrictions on animals, we have restrictions on products, uh, and we have maybe less restrictions on some of other inputs, uh, uh, vaccines, feed ingredients. If you have trade, you have risk. You know, this is at the national level. So if we're dealing, we know what, uh, we're worried about African swine fever at the moment a lot. Uh, we're worried about hog cholera because we don't have that. Uh, we weren't worried as much as we should have been about PED virus. Um, and all of those, we, we, we make judgments about what's the right degree of trade and commerce that we undertake versus how much do we want to shut ourselves off from the world. So we're in a global economy, we're in a global industry. Uh, there's international rules that don't make it that easy just to close the border. Uh, but they're the judgments that we have to make uh, as a country. And uh, I'll sp speak more about feed um, briefly uh, in a minute, but that has certainly been one of the biggest discussion points about PEDV in getting in here. One of the favoured theories early on because we had several outbreaks uh, in sow farms in very different areas that the most likely common factor was, uh, was a feed ingredient. Uh, we have the reality, as to most countries, that there's a large amount of importation of uh, particularly uh, vitamin mineral uh, uh, ingredients uh, that are coming from Asia, including China. Our isolate is very closely related to a Chinese uh, isolate. So one of the prevalent theories, and we don't know how the virus got here, uh, is that the possibility of coming in through a feed ingredient. And that's uh, we have a whole session tomorrow on feed and PEDV that uh, people can go to to get more detail. So uh, we have trade, we have risk. Uh, we could close our borders to importation of uh, uh, vitamin, mineral uh, ingredients at some cost. At the moment, for some of those ingredients, there's no alternative. But we also have, my country of Australia also imports all its vitamin and minerals from the same sources as we do in the U.S., and is yet to suffer an incursion. So do we say, well, it can't have been that, it could have been, was it a one-off event? Uh, as I mentioned, very, very difficult to actually know uh, where things come from. So on the farm side, pretty much the same thing, slightly different list. Obviously, animals are the top of the list. Uh, we're concerned about people movement. We don't, we're not concerned about people movement uh, internationally. We are, but we don't do much about it. Many of you have flown in here uh, from many countries uh, with pretty low level of in scrutiny of, uh, of where you've been, what you've done, uh, certainly some, some questions. We have all our inputs, uh, environment here, all those things we have to think about. We've got lots of successes. So let's say we have biosecurity standards that people more or less adopt in the US. Uh, they've been very, very effective for some diseases. Psychoptic, mange and lice, brucella and pseudorabies. They're endemic in our uh, uh, feral pig population. We keep them out of our commercial industry with a high level of success through our standards of biosecurity practices. What we call exotic diseases, uh, uh, FMD, hog cholera, we have since eliminating hog cholera, we have a long history of successfully excluding those agents. So we're not doing everything wrong. Um, some other ones that are herd level more, trophic rhinitis, uh, APP, uh, really single source, uh, pyramidal breeding stock systems of high health. We've done a lot of things that have enabled us to uh, make those diseases much, much less prevalent in the industry. So our biosecurity practices uh, have a fairly good level of historic success. 
not perfect. TGE and swine dysentery, perhaps uh, less uh, reliably. Uh, on the other hand, there are things that our biosecurity practices have struggled with, and the biggest ones uh, uh, in the US have been PERS, influenza, mycoplasma, and obviously we'd be adding uh, um, high pneumonia, I should put on there, uh, we'd be adding PEDV to that risk. So we have the same sets of, bio, of uh, biosecurity practices, but for this group of agents, we don't have the same level of success of excluding them. Um, emerging diseases, I mentioned African swine fever, and this is where I've got PEDV. So these are diseases that, you know, uh, internationally we're worried about, uh, and now nationally we're worried about with, with T PEDV. So our biosecurity practices haven't held up so well. So we have success, we have failure. What determines uh, uh, success versus failure? Um, there's things related to the, the agent. Uh, obvious things, how it gets out of the pig, the numbers of reproducers of virus that's produced in huge numbers, as appears to be the case with PEDV, or lower numbers, uh, the modes of transmission of that virus. Uh, a very important thing is, is the host range uh, and survival outside the host. PEDV, most of the viruses on our, on our list are PERS, uh, circovirus, highly host specific. So we don't have to worry about them coming from cattle or poultry or other. And influenza is obviously a different uh, beast. Uh, the infectivity, uh, are animals able to be infected at a very low dose, which appears to be the case with PEDV. So we have a, an agent that is produced in very large numbers. Um, uh, we don't know enough yet about its survival outside the host. Uh, Dr. Goyal will be speaking a little bit about that tomorrow. Uh, and we know that the infectious dose is very, very low, even though we, we're still trying to get our hand, hands around that. Obviously, there's host characteristics that are important that play into this, uh, and particularly uh, infectious period in the host, how long do pigs stay infectious for other pigs, and that's influenced by immune status, and characteristics of the environment. And part of that uh, is related to geography, area density. We know with uh, PERS, with uh, influenza, with mycoplasma, we have much more difficulty in biosecurity uh, in hog-dense environments. It's because we have a biosecurity membrane, if we look at it like that, and we know it's got some holes in it, uh, but it's simply the amount of challenge. So we're in, it's just simply a matter of probability and numbers, uh, animal density, uh, hygiene, and this is really where our bio, what our biosecurity measures are doing. We can't really change the agent and the host that much, but we're looking at the sets of biosecurity measures that we can put in place to at least try and uh, reduce uh, or increase our chances of, of success. So I'm really taking a long time to get back to the beginning to say, well, before PEDV, what did we know about biosecurity? We know it's important. Um, we know it's expensive. It doesn't come for nothing. We know it can be annoying. Those of you who have gone into a farm or come out of a farm and you think, you know, I left something in there, I need to go back, I've just had a shower, um, what am I going to do? Uh, it's annoying. Uh, we know it's imperfect. So these are things that we know about biosecurity. And we're trying to do this juggling between how do we balance the cost of our biosecurity uh, procedures against the rate of failure. And really big examples of that where we're still debating would be things like air filtration. Air filtration is the last resort. We've done everything else in our biosecurity. We're still having breaks. Uh, so we're um, looking at a large investment to reduce the risk of what may be a variable uh, and unpredictable risk of airborne transmission. Uh, transport biosecurity. Some of the amount of the, the methods we're using with uh, thermally assisted drying come at considerable cost, but we're making that investment to try and reduce risk. Uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, we're juggling the cost of the outbreak. So our biosecurity standards, where we want to set them, depend on the enterprise. With the bore studs are up there. Uh, I think if we're looking at the upper levels of breeding company pyramids, they're up there. As we come down towards commercial... Uh, particularly finishing pigs, things tend to get relaxed. Um, and we know there's a, like all investments, there's a law of diminishing returns. 
So we can make, uh, from a scenario of next to no or very poor biosecurity with basic uh, low level concentrations, not getting pigs from multiple sources, not buying, if I go back to my early career, buying animals at market was a very common procedure which was a recipe for disaster. We've stopped doing most of those very stupid things that were part of the industry uh, fabric. But as we go up, as we're, each time we're adding more and more cost and we're saving less and less risk. So the other thing we know about biosecurity is that we need very clearly described procedures. We need to know what the rules are and not only the people who are charged with um, following the rules need to understand the procedure. Compliance is key. So it's a culture, an education, uh, in establishing that biosecurity culture, uh, I remember Harvey Hilly gave a very good talk at ASV about developing a biosecurity plan on a farm and making it the responsibility of the people who work on the farm because they understand what they can and can't do more so than the veterinarian from above who says, follow my rules, but actually to give them ownership of their own biosecurity plan, which I think is really important. Understanding the why and the other thing, at the end of the day, no matter how much money we spend as a country or as a farm, you know, zero risk doesn't exist. There is uh, what can go wrong does go wrong. Okay, finally getting round to what Daniel wanted me to talk about, I think. Uh, what has PEDV ta taught us about biosecurity? I'd say, what is it making us ask about biosecurity? Because I think we're still early in the learning lesson. So the first thing is, how leaky is our national biosecurity? So we know, still know we don't have FMD, we don't have African swine fever or hog cholera. There's a lot of threats out there. Um, how many viruses have been introduced? So you'll speak to people in the US who'll say, well, we've got four new viruses now. We know we've got at least one, and we've probably got two, but in terms of uh, being certain things like Delta coronavirus, well, how long has it really been here in terms of did we only discover it when we started looking closely at coronaviruses? So we don't really know when it got here. Um, so if we're worried about our importation of imports to the swine industry, or people, another theory that we, we're not sure about, uh, did things go wrong? Was this just a, a, a lightning strike, a one-off event? You know, our systems are actually pretty good and have a long history of success. Uh, we've had a failure. Does that mean the system is a mess? Uh, or does it mean that it's, it might be another 50 or 70 years before another similar event? How much more do we want to face? So I think we're still, and you'll hear very different opinions uh, on that subject. Some people saying, look, we've got a disaster here. We've got to really make changes. Um, I'm, I'm more a, a conservative. I'm thinking, okay, we know we've had at least one bad event, maybe two. Uh, I'm not sure it's a, it's a disaster. Um, so was this a point source failure or uh, are there systematic deficiencies in national security, meaning we need to uh, look at national biosecurity, I should say. Um, we need to look at where and how we're sourcing uh, uh, all the inputs coming into our industry uh, and move to a higher cost. The reason things we do things at the moment is because we're doing them at lowest cost in the marketplace. Do we want to do things at higher cost, lower risk? What was the source of the failure? Okay, You'll hear a lot of discussion about that. I won't get into it now. When was the failure? The one thing I'd say as a, as a person of an epidemiologist leaning is that the first farm we found is highly unlikely to be the first farm infected. It was a sow farm. There's issues in terms of, uh, you know, the virus hasn't necessarily been that clinically spectacular in older pigs and finishing pigs. We have a lot of segregated uh, growing pig populations. So the hypothesis that the virus could have been introduced earlier into the growing pig population, which is 90% of our pig population uh, versus that individual sow farm, uh, can't be dismissed. And I think some of the work early on, very early in the epidemic, uh, Dr. Jim Lowe looked at, at uh, trucks going to slaughter and found quite a remarkably high number of contaminated trucks fairly early a month, couple of months after the first case. So how did it get so far so fast? Um, when was the failure? 
So we don't really know that. What needs to be changed? Um, and I think these are, like I said, I'm not, I haven't got the answers for you here. You'll hear a lot more information and opinion about, about these over the next couple of days. The other thing that we've learned is that PEDV is not TEGV, not uh, transmissible gastroenteritis. There was, a, I think, pretty widely acknowledged complacency in the, in the US when PEDV came, and we think, well, it's a coronavirus. It looks just like TGE in disease. We're really good at managing TGE, TGE, TGE V outbreaks. Uh, we know how to get it off farms. Uh, what we've learned is it's not the same virus, even though it's a very uh, similar clinical disease. People would say our current standards are okay with TGE because we've evolved to develop them and live with that, uh, but they're not okay for PEDV, or they haven't been. Um, we know that it's an enormously high virus production and extremely low infectivity. We had a totally naive population, so there's a lot of firewood there for when you start the epidemic. Um, the immune response appears to be quite different. In particularly in terms of the uh, elimination efforts. You'll learn more about that. Uh, and just a general lack, relative lack of knowledge. There hasn't been that much research of, of uh, PED, a lot of information known and a lot of experience. Uh, so I think the first thing, one of the things we've learned is we, can, we just can't uh, believe that even when the diseases appear clinically uh, similar and the agents are similar, that the epidemiology will be equivalent. Um, one of the biggest questions um, about biosecurity is in this piece. If we take the pigs and the semen out of the question, uh, viruses come from the host animal and they go to the host animal, but the, from a point of view of once we take the pig-to-pig -pig contact out of it, the big issue that drives the biosecurity is the stability of the virus outside the host. Um, and again, we have, I've just, um, Dr. Goyal will be talking about that tomorrow. There'll be a lot more information and in, in we're, we're still trying to understand how stable this virus might be. Uh, so things that might influence that from the agent side are the concentration, we've spoken about it, the, the structural characteristics of the virus. It's an envelope virus. Envelope usually means that the viruses are much more susceptible to uh, disinfectants, not necessarily the thermal uh, processing. Uh, the strain characteristics, we know for some viruses that their survival characteristics can be quite different between different strains of the same virus. Uh, and what it's in is over here, the material that it's in and does the virus aggregate. So there'll be a lot of things that physically influence survival. On the environment side, the ones that we know for all viruses really matter, uh, temperature, relative uh, humidity, water activity, pH, presence of organic matter, uh, possibility or degree of UV light exposure. These things will influence survival. Uh, and the other thing that is very important is the matrix or the material that the virus is in or on. Uh, so we know feces behaves differently to water. Uh, we're trying to understand uh, what it might mean for feed uh, and fomites or just uh, um, inanimate uh, systems. So we have a lot to learn yet about the virus, but until we know more about this characteristic of survival, uh, it's hard to answer the question of how much do we need to change the rules, the rules or where are the true risks um, lying. So our big questions, okay, one thing is we have an industry on wheels, meaning we move pigs all over the countryside uh, on a daily uh, uh, basis. We accept that risk. We know that moving pigs moves swine pathogens. Uh, we're have enough faith, rightly or wrongly, in our biosecurity practice just to say that we're good enough to keep it out of farms that we don't want to stop all this commercial movement, which is people are doing to make money because they have relationships that give them the best uh, uh, return. So uh, the whole issue of you know how smart is our model uh, with large farms and a lot of movement over long distances with these sorts of events, and is anyone willing to make any change in that area. And that's been a big issue with PERS, circovirus habits. The role of feed is a very contentious one, and the, as I said, we'll be talking a lot about that tomorrow. Uh, how important is 
or was transmission by a feed. So some of the questions here is, is PEDV uniquely adapted to the feedborne realm? So what would it be about this virus that if transmission via feed matters, we don't talk about transmission of feed for other infectious agents in the pig world. We talk about salmonella as a foodborne risk. BSE in cattle has been a phenomenally important issue. So we know, and we know from first principles, there is some risk in feed. We've never heard a paper given on transmission of PERS in, uh, in feed. So my question is, you know, does that mean it has never occurred? Uh, PEDV is unique, or does it mean that perhaps uh, there is a low risk of transmission of these summer agents, but we've never detected it because we've put down transmission to other routes. So it's keeping the open mind on this feed issue. So we're, they're questions that we are hoping to move towards answering. Um, airborne transmission, uh, again, um, uh, Carmen Alonso, one of our students, recently published a paper where she was able to demonstrate uh, uh, aerosol transmission in a model. Uh, we have some, uh, through Dane Godey's work, actually in the same paper, uh, detection of uh, PCR positive air samples quite some distance. I think it was uh, several miles from an infected farm. So we can say logistically the virus can be spread. Uh, it can be transmitted uh, uh, by aerosol. There's just recently a paper from Japan showing that P, at least a PEDV strain was able to replicate in alveolar macrophages. Does that matter or not? We didn't know that about the virus before. So again, all of these things are in the can happen thing, but we're trying to work out does it happen? How much does it ha happen? And the other thing is um, we can't work to figure all this stuff out. We can't wait, sorry, to figure it all out. People have to deal with the risks today and make decisions. So a lot of the things are precautionary. So uh, a very common precaution taken in the US was to stop feeding all feed ingredients of pig origin, uh, which means rendered products, it means uh, spray dried uh, blood products, uh, it means um, uh, some other hydrolyzed products. Uh, valuable feed ingredients, cost competitive that we put into diets because uh, we think that was the best and cost-effective way to feed the pigs. So that decision was saying, we think there's a risk there. Uh, you'll see the evidence of that tomorrow if you're at the symposium. Uh, we're going to make that decision. We can't wait for two years for the professors and the other people to try and figure out what might be a vague answer. Uh, so we have this balance between having to make the risk of the biosecurity decisions uh, versus waiting to know more. Uh, obviously... Um, as I said, we have uh, what we have pretty well defined best practices. So uh, the more we can get uh, people in the industry understanding those practices, um, complying them, particularly with things that can be done at low cost. Uh, I think it's uh, a different thing to uh, ask people to figure out the nutritional program uh, versus not walk back through the shower. So this is in my summary. I think. Um, PEDV has taught us nothing about biosecurity. Uh, all the issues of biosecurity, what it does, how it works, we already knew that. Um, but what PED done has changed the equation of this balance we get between how much investment we're willing to put into uh, and how much risk reduction we're getting. Uh, and these questions are, does at a national level, does our system have to change? Um, you'll hear a lot of debate about that. Um, it, um, and I mentioned it should have in here, it changed the equation nationally at the farm level. Um, so it shifted the cost uh, and benefit of biosecurity investment. Uh, the, the question we're still struggling with is understanding, uh, I like to see it as a, like a pie chart of transmission, that if we could, if we could know how all the farms in the, in the country got infected over the last year and know how many we could allocate to transport and how many we could allocate to animal movement and how much we could allocate to people and how much to feed or other fomites, uh, we're in a much better position to actually weigh our practices in, a, in, a, in an informed way. But that requires real knowledge that takes a long time.